Hey, Kyle. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm um, great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, taking the time today to talk about this. Hot, hot heat after all of this time. I mean, I don't. you guys have been a band for 15, 16 years, something like that. 17 years, maybe? Yeah, we started in 99. And then before that, we were in a bunch of other bands uh, with similar members. I was usually in three or four bands at any given point, and usually each one of those bands had at least one member of Hot Hot Heat in them. <laughs> and Hot Hot Heat ended up just being the one that took off. Yeah, I think I think it was just because uh, we added a, a keyboard, which in 99 was seemed like a shocking thing because it was still kind of, you know, the grunge era, and everyone was still burnt out on keyboards after the 80s kind of overdid it, you mm. know? It's funny to look back and then too. So I, you're only a, a, you're 38, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm 34. So you're you're only a few years older than me. So 99 was the year I graduated high school, and I look at that time and I think it's one of the worst periods in rock and roll history for what was oh, man. big I on the totally pop charts. Agree. Everything everything was such uh, a downer. Everything was so negative and serious. And yeah. you know, I guess the 80s was all Lamborghini Countaches and. <laughs> cocaine and you know people dreaming of uh of the you know capitalism was still the american dream and i don't know it was just kind of a, a became a plastic phony nightclub feeling i guess in the 80s so it made sense that you know grunge came in and was a response to the the phony glam metal and, and 80s stuff but i don't know i personally i like music that helps me escape i don't like things that that make me feel depressed yeah. So here we are on Hot Hot Heat's last record, as you've announced. Uh, but it would seem to me like you're having to, it's making you look back a lot at these times, at the beginning of, uh, of the band's career. And I, I guess what I get from you, from what I read, is that you're not a person who likes to look back very often because you're always working on something new. Yeah. I mean, if you get too reflective, it's dangerous because, you know, there's so many ways you can look at things. And, you know, I definitely have a critical mind. I, I can go down that rabbit hole. You know, I can I can watch a documentary on how about peak oil or, you know, like some sort of world crisis. And then that's all I can think about for, you know, the next six months. Mm -hmm. So I have to be careful what I dwell on. And I, I find that if I just keep on moving towards things that get me excited to get out of bed, that you know just something creative whether it's photography or you know making a music video or you know starting a new group or you know getting really excited about mixing and production and different kinds of music and i don't know and also you know technology is changing so fast it's such an exciting time if you are into the arts to just be embracing it all and i guess i just i'm not a big fan of just doing the same thing all the time and that is the one downside of being in an established rock band is, you know, you can you have to subscribe to the album cycle and you have to go and promote it, you know, ideally worldwide if you want to do it well and play a lot of your back catalog, you know, for years and years. And I don't know, it, it's it's good for the bank account to do the proper rock band album cycle thing, but it's just not it's not good for a sustainable creative output for me at least yeah it, it's kind of interesting you know i've talked about it with other artists before that music is one of the only times where we ask you to recreate something from a long time ago over and over and over and you're always held up to that like you know no one was telling picasso like why didn't your new painting look like your old painting from 20 years ago you know but totally uh, totally <laughs> and yeah it's like even bands like radiohead which are known for you know, always trying to reinvent themselves. I'm sure 90% of the audience is still dying to hear them play Creep. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. There's just no way to avoid it. Hopefully people have at least, uh, of any band out there, hopefully they've got the uh, the gist of Radiohead now that more than likely you're not going to hear Creep. But, but, <laughs> but you, exactly. know, you know, when Hot Hot Heat took the stage, yeah. that you were still held at some point to those early songs, like the entire time. Like, and that's... Totally, and and I, you know, we we embraced it because, you know, we we always wanted to be a band that was entertaining first, you know, and like, you know, not be afraid to shy away from that. We wanted to put on a good show, and wanted to please the crowd, uh, and we wanted to innovate our sound and stretch our sound and you know expand as well. But we n never wanted to 
do it in a way that was disrespectful to people that were paying good money to come see a good show, you know. So, yeah. But at a certain point, it was just like a switch went off, and it was like, you know what? I, I don't know if I want to make one album every two years. I want to make a few albums a year kind of thing, you know. Which is really, really exciting. That when you're, you know, when you make an announcement like you guys did to say, okay, we're going to do one more, but that's it. Like, is there any mental preparation you have to, 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 you know, get ready for knowing that at this point, all the folks like me, like that you're going to be talking to, even the fans, you know, it's going to be a conversation about putting a certain part of your life in a box. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I did think about it this morning actually for the first time it kind of went through my head like this is starting to feel like an official decision and an official life choice you know and i am closing doors by doing this but i really never thought about it too much before that it just kind of seemed like oh well this seems like the direction the band's going and i just want to keep being creative and excited about making art yeah um so, you know, I guess it seems like we're calling it a day, so we may as well announce that that's what's kind of happened. And also, so much of the so much of this record is, and all the music I'm making these days, is me trying to sing about things that are real to me and sincere. And I, I find, like, my favorite actors and musicians and all artists are people that, where when I watch it or I listen to it, I feel like I'm getting a piece of who they actually are. Mm-hmm. And you get some insight it solves the riddle and the mystery and yeah this album is just very close to who i am i know well where sure. where did you go um, for that lyrical inspiration because i know you'd been writing these over a few years like was you know did did you find that uh, there were any certain spots that you were definitely looking for when you went for the words just reflecting on on friendships and how people change and life is really unpredictable and you can't really you can't really expect people to turn out the way you want them to turn out and you you plan your you sort of plan your life but it never really turns out the way you expected it to and so yeah a lot of it is about people growing up and changing and like nothing none of the people that i that i grew up with turned out the way i expected them to turn out and my life didn't turn out the way i expected it to and and so i i guess like to go back to your question about making a decision to to end the band. I don't know. Life just never really felt like a decision. It's just kind of always flown in, in the wind or blown in the wind, you know. And uh, the one thing I know is if I'm inspired uh, and excited about what I'm working on that day, I just do a way better job. And anything I've done that I'm not proud of or I'm embarrassed of, it's when I was trying to force a square through a circle and be something that I'm not. So I just kind of stopped doing that and stopped worrying about it. And but yeah, being in a band is tough because you you have to basically uh, you know work with four people's emotions and in the case of Hot at Heat they were all uh, a personality types you know they were all really you know it was like putting lightning in a bottle like and I was surprised that we even stayed together 17 years because everyone really wanted to be the star and really wanted to get the spotlight and and I think that's what made the live show really exciting but. Man, it was like a lot of personality to try and rein in on every record. You know, you talk about, you know, the end and closing the doors and, and being surprised that it lasted that long. It, it should be pointed out, though, that bands do get way more famous when you go away, especially when the public knows that you can't have you anymore. That's when we want you the most, time and time again. You know, that's, uh, that's you know, that's, I think that's what brought back a lot. That's what brought back pavement, you know. So if nothing else, this might be the best marketing thing that you guys have ever done. <laughs> yeah, I, there's probably is like a, a X, Y axis or a threshold where it's like, you know what? It would actually be less, there's like more pros to us getting back together than there are cons for people getting <laughs> mad at us that we like faked the whole thing. But <laughs> for now, for now it feels very real, but I'm sure there is like a, a dollar figure, not that we're doing it for the money types at all, but mm-hmm. for it. Well, it, it is it is a bit torturous uh, for us that I would say this is your best record. Like this is Hot Hot Heat's greatest achievement. It's it's so solid from front to back, and that is ex- especially a torture when you get all this. Like it's great to go out on the high note, but suddenly you're like, damn man, you guys still had that in you. You know that's oh, man, that's amazing. That makes me so happy. Yeah, it's fun because a lot of it a lot of it was made with me just feeling like 
you know, we've had our time in the in the sun, and I don't even know if anyone gives a crap if we put out another album. Like, I knew there was the hardcore fans, but um, I definitely didn't expect to get such, you know, good feedback from people listening to the record and, you know, saying that, like, every, all the feedback I've gotten on what songs people like, you know, it's all over the map. Like, songs that I thought were like, oh, I don't even know if anyone's going to like this one or ending up being fan favorites and stuff. So it does feel really good to um, to feel like people care. And I think being away for a while, like you say, is like it's a really good thing. I think it does make people appreciate you a bit more. So right. that, feels, that feels good. Yeah, there's. I mean, some of the, of course, the single "Kid Who Stays in the Picture" is great, and the Bobby Jones sex tape. I, I really kind of centered in on pulling levers personally, just as a you know personal favorite. I, I don't know if you caught it, but it gives me this great, um, the way you make me feel, the the Michael Jackson. It's that the way that bass lays oh, down it gives me. Good. Yeah, it's got such a sound at the beginning of it. Uh, well, that that album that album was was big for me. Uh, I was a big Bad fan. Cause that was off bad, right? I think it was off bad, yeah. Yeah, there was, there's like a few different grooves that you just can't get away from. Like, there's the Lust for Life groove, right. you know, that, that Jet did and This Charming Man and The Supremes and like countless bands. And then there's that groove from Pulling Levers, which no matter what you do, people are going to compare it to a few hits that use that groove. But I remember at the time being like, is this too much? <laughs> Uh, like that MJ song, or it's just too much like Tears for Fears, and it's like, I don't care. It just feels so good. So, uh, that's half the uh, reason why it pulled me it. in. You know, I'm, I'm definitely happy you uh, you kept it like that. So, it, you know, never in my mind did I go, oh, they're uh, ripping it off. That wasn't a part of it. It was like, oh, cool. Oh, man. But I like I like that you lo- that you like that one. It kind of it reminds me of a, like 10 different songs. Like, I, I also hear a bit of. Mike Snow and Passion Pit. At mm-hmm. times, I hear a bit of Bowie in it, and it's like it. That song went. We did so many different demos of it, and just playing with it and trying different things. That by the end, it just seemed like a compilation of a bunch of our favorite things, and it just kind of had a feeling. And that was the one part of the reason why we put the album out. You know, we we finished it, and we were like, "Are we going to put it out? Is it even worth putting it out if we're not going to stay together?" Um, but our friends that had the album that we gave it to. They'd always bring up pulling levers, like you gotta put it out just for pulling levers. And you, uh, I mean, there's got to be lots of of lost dogs in your catalog that never made it out, uh, just from album to album. I know how that usually works. I mean, do do you foresee like even if the band is completely, actually, officially, forever, always done, like are you the kind of person that would go back later for, you know, just to clean out the closet or anniversary editions or anything like that, and and throw some of those back out that never made it? Yeah, you know what? I would. I have a Dropbox. I was looking for a song that my girlfriend wanted to hear that was a, like an unreleased song that, that I played for once. She was like, you got to send it to me. So I was going through a bunch of different folders on different hard drives, and I put together, I think it was, I've got a folder of 32 B-sides and unreleased songs. Wow. And I was like, man. So I sent it to our manager, and I said, maybe we should do this. And somebody somebody started a petition online to... <laughs> To get an unreleased uh, record out, and but yeah, our manager was just like overwhelmed with the, the work he had to do on this album. So it's like one thing at a time. Buddy. So, <laughs> so maybe would, in the future, I, I personally would be open to it. Also, um, you know, I've had my own studio since 2008, um, and I'm constantly working on different records and stuff like that. So it would be a fun thing for me, I think, to get a bunch of old files from years ago of songs that weren't released and just play with them and it, I, I love mixing it's like I mixed this this most recent record and it's like taking somebody's clay and molding it you know mm-hmm. and even if it is your own music you kind of detach from it and it's just like you think of it like art like I remove all ego and just kind of have fun you know yeah it's it's kind of been cool keeping up with whatever you're doing outside of Hot Hot Heat because I mean I know you've got Fur Trade and Mounties but I, I guess I read that you're also like working with Diplo and and Fitz and you know let, that's a very different world that I guess you get to exercise a very different muscle for. Uh, yeah, sort of like it's I mean, I think that goes back to what you were saying about just not overthinking it and just kind of working on a ton of stuff. I just really try and stay busy and stay creative and you know um there's usually enough things on the table that i can let my mood dictate what i'm going to work on that day you know and it's like like with the 
Steve Aoki Diplo track, it was like, I think he called me at like one in the morning and was just like, hey, like, can we, we want to get you on this track. Like, it might be the first single. Like, can we fly you down to LA kind of thing? And I was like, you could, but I'm already working on like two records at the moment. And how about I just like, I'll try something and send it to you. And I wasn't really in an EDM state of mind. And, uh, but I knew there was a bit of a deadline. So a couple of days went by and I was just like, I'm just going to like drink the better half of a bottle of wine and just see what happens. <laughs> literally just, just recorded, like wrote and recorded the vocals in about 15 minutes while my friends were waiting for like the guys in Nazis were waiting down the hall yeah. and just sent it off to him. And that was that. Um, and so I think it's that luxury of being able to just wait till you're in the perfect headspace in like your own comfortable environment and you can, and I recorded it, you know, distorted the way I wanted my voice to sound. And it's like, there's so many stars that have to align for something to work out. And just so, you know, just so that if you can kind of control some of those stars, you know, there's, and eliminate some of the potential pitfalls and variables that, you know, might have been the reason why songs didn't work in the past. You know, yeah. that's kind of the dream scenario. I mean, I've always heard the uh, the marker of success, or I've always thought of it anyway, is that you the luxury of time. Once you've got the luxury yeah. of time, you've you've certainly done what you've needed to do. Oh man, time is everything. It's you know, and I actually moved to LA for a while, and I was working in different studios there, and I just I didn't like it because of how I had to spend so much time driving around and just sorting out mundane life details. There was just so many complications, and you know, I love living in a quiet neighborhood uh, near the water mm. in Vancouver where I'm 10 minutes from my studio and I can, time is, is so valuable, yeah. more than money. <laughs> That's true. I agree. I'm glad it's all working out for you, Steve. And, uh, you know, as I wrap this up, um, the new record, seriously, I, I love this Hot Hot Heat record, but I'm excited to see all the things that you're doing. I mean, I, I assume now it's just uh, going to be an onslaught of, uh, of releases from you. So, <laughs> Well, I've got, I've got three records of my own that I'm working on right now while I'm doing this Hot Hot Heat press, and, and I'm just building a mobile mix rig because, at the moment, actually, because I want to finish well, I'm working on two Mounties records at once and a new fur trade record and there's a ton of mixes that need to be finished and um, I'm going to be flying to a small town in Nova Scotia where I hope I can do a lot of mixing there with this mobile rig and if that doesn't work I'll come and finish it at home but the main thing is I just want to always be inspired and excited and only putting stuff out that I think is feels fresh and youthful you know yeah that's a that's a hell of a workload right there, but uh, good on you. So. Ah, thanks. I, I really do appreciate the kind words on on the record because I honestly had no clue if anyone was going to give a shit. So it's so nice to hear you say that, Kyle. No, well, thank you so much for uh, for you know sticking it out, and putting another one out there, not just letting it languish and you know and and fade into the past as uh, you could have easily done. So uh, I'm happy to have this ah. record and happy to be playing it too. So. Oh man, it's it's so great. Well. So nice talking with you, buddy. You too, Steve. Well, I'll see you around eventually, somewhere, hopefully, or or at least I'll hear you. Yeah, the world the world is small. <laughs> so I've noticed. All right, take it easy and take care. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. All right, bye.